That's not, it's not in five. The song isn't in five. If you think it's in five, there's something wrong with you. And I thought it was in five, so there's something wrong with me. Funny how it do be like that. All right, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Oh, howdy, everybody. Welcome to August. My name is Bendale, and welcome to the Bendale stream. I hope y'all, y'all appreciate how, how obnoxious is that? Very, yeah. Yeah, I thought so, so. Today is the 1st of August, 2022. I hope you all pinched and punched everyone on the first day of the month, and if you didn't, then uh, get look up that tradition. It's a real tradition, I swear, where you pinch and punch someone on the first day of the month. Um, it's still cold. I hate it being cold, uh, but the 1st of August signifies the end of the F1 first stint of the year. And they're on a long break. I cannot talk about motorsports any longer. But instead of talking about motorsports, why don't I show you a game that is near and dear and so veneer to my heart. Let's switch to it. Sorry, I've cut off the very beginning of the PlayStation logo. It's a PlayStation game. And it's a game that uh, I've played twice on this channel already. The first with um, a terrible camera view. I think this was actually the first game I didn't emulate on my channel. I played, uh, well, there it is, Spyro the Dragon. I played on a real, I think I had like a Sanyo, um, CRT TV at the time. And I, uh, and I sh showed either a laptop or an iToy. I think it was a laptop. And I was just angling it at the TV and you could, you could only tell what the game actually was. Um, then I had replayed it with, uh, the weird mock capture device I had. It wasn't an amazing capture device. Um, I think I was a child in both of those. So, I thought, why don't I play it again? Uh, this is the third time the charm, so let's do the third slot, and away we go. But now, uh, this game is near and dear to my heart. I, because it's, I mean, I've got that set of PS1 games that I absolutely loved at the beginning of when I played games. Let's uh, listen to this. Oh, it's been peaceful here in the five worlds, or is it six? For a dragon's age. We now have 12,000 treasure, or is it 14,000? What about this Ganasty Ganort character? Now I understand he's found a magic spell to turn gems into warriors for his cause. I'll take that question. Nasty Nork is a simple creature. Simple. He has been contained in a remote world and is no threat to the Dragon Kingdom. No threat! Besides, he is an ugly bad does it? Oh. And everybody is turned Looks to like crystal. Then Spyro walks off with his lack of teeth. And the game begins. I love how simple it is, but also I guess like, as a layman who didn't play too many games, that was kind of all the introduction I really needed. And then you start off, and then I go, okay, what's the first thing I notice as a young lad who doesn't know how to play games? I know how to push forward and immediately walk up to this. I got a little intimidated by the dragon's first try, but... Thank you for releasing me, Spyro. He's awfully quiet in the mix, isn't he? Then find the balloonist. He'll transport you to the next world. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. Find dragons first. That's all I can tell you. But you know what? It's like, oh, okay. And then I see a number go from zero to one. And me and my child brain goes, ah, I'm collecting things. I just got one of them. Uh, if I hit select, I can see one slash four. And I go, ah, okay. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Here's these like shiny things. Oh, I got another number going up. And it made so much sense to me. So, the more I played this game, you know, I, I it was tricky for me to really fully understand. Because um, there's a lot of, like, this game is fairly neat in how it works. It's a collectathon that doesn't feel like it's an absolute chore. Your only real restriction from going to, from one place to the next is these balloonists who take you from one world to the next by imposing some weird arbitrary limit of going, you literally have to prove yourself. It, 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 
He has the ability to carry you, he just doesn't believe he should carry you. So, okay. Um, but you're okay. So you got the starting world. I, the only damage you can take is the water. The water is there to tell you that water hurts. Uh, and also, as a little bit of a health indicator, let's see if I can actually trigger this. Touch the water, suddenly the dragonfly turns blue. Oh my goodness, what does this guy tell you about? Where's Nasty Nork? I'll torch him. Keep your horns on, Spyro. You have much to learn first. Do you know what the dragonfly following you is doing? Um... His name is Sparks, and he's helping and protecting you. Keep an eye on him and see what I mean. I feel like I've never actually second-guessed what- how a dragonfly protects you. I feel like it's just the name, but it's a clever, like, on-screen in indicator to show you your health, basically. The dragonfly starts at yellow, you take a hit, he turns blue, take a hit, he turns green, take a hit, he goes away, and also every gem that you pick up, because, uh, no, if you stand near- hold on, I'm, I'm gonna get me one of these. Every uh, gem that you go close to, he'll pick it up, so you can visually see him do stuff. And when he's not there, he doesn't pick him up. You might see me uh, not pick up gems later. You've got to physically walk into them, and it feels like an absolute, you know, chore to get things. Then you see this, and you wonder, oh. Cool flash. Do that again. The artisan's boss is through a portal in the dragon mouth, but you are not yet ready, Spyro. First, you must complete one of the other artisan lands. I forgot what the actual, like, imposed limit was. I was thinking it was a, a nu like a number of dragons you had to rescue beforehand. He makes it sound like you've just gotta, you know, enter a level and complete it, basically. So, okay. You got lives. Um, the game doesn't necessarily teach you the difference between charging and flaming. Most, in fact, every enemy in this beginning part dies from both. But... You know what, it's a starting, it's a starting value. Um, the other thing I guess is that, uh, yeah, you can keep going around and collecting all these gems, but obviously, you know, you gotta get some real meat on your bones. You gotta do an actual level. So what do you do? Well, here's a level. Let's go into it. And this blew my mind as a kid. It's like Spyro jumps in, the skybox changes just right on the fly, and Spyro remains on screen the entire time while the new level happens. That blew my mind, because other games I had played, I'd played several other disc games, including, um, I don't know why, I, uh, Mega Race pops in my mind. I, I did have Mega Race as a kid, and do I ever want to play Mega Race again? Mm, maybe not, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I, I own other disc-based uh, games, a lot of driving games. Um, uh, what's another like PS1 game I had? That wasn't a driving game. Uh, that Monsters Inc. game's got the horrendous loading screens. Um, I don't know why I'm blanking on all these PS1 games. My sister had like a Mary Kate and Ashley game, I'll just chuck that one in. That Rugrats game I played earlier. You know, a lot of PS1 games have the loading screens, and while you could certainly tell it's loading, the fact that stuff is happening on the screen, it's visually like stimulating. It just makes the experience so much more fun. Now, these enemies, you have to flame. They're big. The game, uh, might teach it later. Might, maybe. They're also a little bit obnoxious to, to like, dodge. My, one of my biggest issues with this game, I guess, is how long Sparks takes to eat things. He did queue it up. So, uh, you can go up here, and here's a guy up here who gives you a little Hint on gliding. His name is almost Glidus. It's Gildas, though. Friend, how about a hint on gliding? Oh wow! You bet. For the longest glide, press the X button at the top of a jump, and try pressing the triangle button to drop down in mid-flight. So wow, useful advice, sure. Um, but yeah, it's basically just say, hey, you can stop. You can stop uh, gliding if you want to. And then this also blew my mind, the fact that this border wasn't just a border to the level. It was, well, it, it is still, because you've got a invisible force field. But it's the fact that coming up here was part of the level design. And there's a, I, I'm trying to think if there's any other levels in the game that really have this. But 
this threw me off the first time I played it, because the only things that are really up here are extra goodies and this guy up here, who, like, f for reference as well, I only have to collect 200 treasure and four dragons. But suddenly, after flaming this guy and watching this mystical pink object float towards me, I now have that, and I now have a counter on the top. And that kind of blew my mind as a kid. Not that I had that, necessarily, the first time, because I, uh, I collected my first dragon egg when the game tells you about them, which is in the third world. There's a dragon, or there's an egg thief, directly in front of you. Um, I just found them too difficult to get to. Um, but that counter didn't show up until, you know, you get your first egg. So it kind of blew my mind in terms of just, like, you know, what actually, like, really nifty presentation can do. The, you know, the, the 3D little numbers in the, in the top of the screen. It's just, like, it's such a nice, like, visual... visual flair. And something I thought was a little bit sad that they didn't continue on with any of the other games. They... They didn't continue, they just went with uh, flat numbers on screen. Possibly for a uh, rendering. Like maybe they just need to save on a few triangles and said, well, that's the easiest way to do it. Then we don't have to keep a bunch of numbers in memory. Um, also, I guess there's something I couldn't quite understand, but it makes a lot of sense when you look at this level. The fog is very minimal. You can see the buildings right at the other side of the level, but you can obviously tell they're LOD swapped. LOD, the level of detail, uh, just means that uh, as an object is further away, it's actually a lower uh, polygon version. There's fewer vertices of the object. And as you come closer, more detail starts to come in. It gets replaced with a, a more detailed version. It's particularly apparent in terms of the textures, like the buildings at the other side of this hallway seem entirely flat. The moment you come close, the textures start loading in. Um, but what this does is that there's a lot of games that came out around um, pretty much the entirety of the PS1 lifespan. Oh, lots of chess. Good feeling. Um, there were a lot of games that came out around the PS1 era and had fog. And you couldn't see the edge of the... You couldn't see, see the other side of the level. So it just didn't look as impressive. When you as impressive. a dragon or step on one of their platforms, you're saving your progress. That could be useful if you run into trouble. Not that you ever run into trouble, Spyro. Ah, yes. Now, I feel like this UX element is a little bit weird. Um, the fact that walking over one of these points checkpoints your game, and very awkwardly holding onto it, standing onto it, means you can save the game to your memory card, which fortunately happens very quickly, and you can replay what the dragon says if you missed out. Um, it's an interesting... Uh, bit of UX. Uh, I don't think anything the game specifically tells you. I think you just kind of have to accidentally wander upon it. Or in the manual. It might be in the manual. I think that's a lot of things that... In a bunch of older games, you can sometimes chalk it up to just... It's in the manual. After you freed all the dragons, pass through this fancy vortex uh, thingamajigger. It'll take you back to the artisan home. But first, let me tell you a story. No thanks. See ya. So we're collecting dragons. Picking up treasure. You know? It's a wonderful, like, brisk pace that you can take this game as well. Because really, the fun is to do the cleanup. And you also get these, you know, you can, some of the levels have keys in them. I've specifically wandered around the level in a certain way so I don't find the chest first. Um, but. Uh, oh, I especially love just how this game, like, you know, lays it all out. And the fact that, you know, the key makes sense. To my, my peanut-brained three-year-old... Three-year-old? It's probably not three when I first played this. Maybe four. I think four. Um, I probably rented this game first. Probably did. And fun fact, I never played the third game until 2016. I played the first two for the longest time, and I never played the third one. Uh, for a long time, so. Watch the dragonfly, Spyro. His color indicates his power. When he eats butterflies, he stays strong. Like me. Uh, sure. Do, do dragonflies legitimately eat butterflies? I've never even checked the, the dragonfly diet. Uh, but anyway, that is 200 out of 200. That is the one egg, and that is four dragons in this level. Uh, I think I might have 
Um, I don't think you get an indicator for collecting all the dragons or all the eggs. You just get one for getting all the treasure if you didn't pick up a dragon at the very moment. <laughs> so, uh, we're returning home. I appreciate this returning home as well. It gives you some importance to the hub world. Now, all the enemies respawn when you exit the map, uh, but if you picked up the treasure that they did drop, you get this little weird orb. What's the name of this orb? I don't know off the top of my head. This jump peeved the heck out of me as a kid. It's rather awkward. I don't know why it's that awkward, but it is. Uh, so if I go back over to this guy, does he- does this jaw just open? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, it does, so... Here's an interesting fact as well. If you replay this dragon dialogue, he actually says something cool different. Flash. Do that again. The artisan's boss has threw a portal behind me. You can challenge him now, if you feel you are ready. Now he makes it sound like it's a challenge, but if you picked up the dragon earlier, you'd probably miss out on the fact he does change his dialogue. Um, and then it says confronting. You're not entering a level. You are confronting Toasty. That builds the drama. I really like it. It's like, that makes... You know, this level feels so much more special compared to the other ones. Even though, all the boss levels are just regular levels. They're regular levels with a slightly big dude at the end, but the slightly big dude is usually... like, three times as bad as a regular enemy, which is not that much. These dogs gave me a lot of trouble as a kid. I'm probably gonna accidentally still take a hit from the dogs. Uh, I can never perfectly take them out. Because uh, you flame them, they get angry, they jump, and then you can kind of beat them to the jump as well. You flame them, you jump, flame them again, seems to get them. Now, quite a number of these boss levels are rather on the simple side. This one's fairly simple. Oh, whoa. hi there. How you doing, dog? Cool. Um, I think there's only a, yeah, there's only a hundred gems on this level. Uh, every boss level only has one dragon in it as well, so, oops. Um, usually the dragon is just before where the boss is. I wonder where the dra- <laughs> where the boss is, you know? Pretty got a little fun little doorway down the side here. Um, that's one thing that kind of makes these games a little interesting to me. Ah, oh, yes, I guess we can demonstrate what happens when you don't have sparks. You have to physically pick up the gems. You get no hold, holding hands, you just gotta go for it, so. I appreciate the way so much of this music, like, builds up and even repeats motifs between, uh... Oh. Nasty Nork has put one of his most devious henchmen in charge of the artisan world. Bring him on! I think I smell a barbecue! Be careful, Spyro! This boss has many tricks up his sleeve. This is, uh, that sounds very daunting the first time you, you hear of it. Um, and then, uh, and then you come up against him, he's a big guy. Oh! Well, he, he bad at you. So you flame him and he just kind of ducks into the next area. Right, I'm gonna hit both dogs in one go. And then you flame him for a second time and you realize it's just a pig on, a pig? A sheep on stilts. And there's three of these dogs. A little bit of it. Well, you can hit him in the back there. He drops a lot of these blue gems. Seems fancy, but ultimately that's that's the level. Flick it around, 100 out of 100, call it a day, return home. Some of these levels, they are kind of quick. But I think that is like, you know, a bit of the charm of the game. Not the, not the short levels, but the brevity of how this game so like works. The, the sequels definitely are bigger and better sequels in the sense of there's more going on. Uh, usually they include a lot of like mini games, uh, there's characters that you talk to in the levels, uh, a lot of these like weird little challenges. Kind of inspired uh, a lot by um, I think Banjo-Kazooie and I'm trying to think like another um, collectathon platformer at the time that did introduce a lot of mini games. Because Mario 64 is rather straightforward isn't it? A lot, of a lot of the levels of Mario 64 follow the structure, and Spyro the Dragon kind of aimed to be that Mario 64 competitor, and I think it probably is the best PlayStation Collectathon. Your choice on whether uh, 1, 2, or 3 is the best game out of them. I think that they're all equally, equally as good, but you'll find preference in which ones. I think uh, my current taste is 
uh, one, then three, then two. But I still think two is a very good game. Uh, oops. I hate these ledges, though. Uh, so big enemies, you gotta flame them. The shield enemies with metal shields, you gotta charge them. There you go. Rumbly rumble rumble. Oh, it's you. I wasn't sure if you'd escape those annoying little creatures. Of course, they wouldn't bother me, but here's a hint. Metal armor is fireproof, but a charge attack will take care of them. There you go. So there's your, there's your metal tutorial, I guess. Uh, this is an interesting path down here as well. Um, because you get introduced to this enemy. Now, as an introduction, they don't actually damage you with this guy. He just kind of... I don't know how that even works. Uh, but he's big and metal. And he taunts you a bit. So you have to duck off a bit, wait for him to turn around, and suddenly he's just the big enemy from the back. I really like this idea that nearly every enemy uh, is unique to its level. Or maybe it appears in a couple of levels. But there's a lot of, like, you know nice differences between all the levels. I mean, we've had like the sunset level, the daytime level, the nighttime level. Spyro, want to know a secret? Use the triangle button when you want to zoom in and look around. Oh, your secret's safe with me. Well, there's ten dragons, so I guess I could duck off to the next world if I want. I've never actually done um, too many, uh, just any percent runs of this game. I definitely, I've tried running, um, like, just seeing how quickly I can do 100% in this game. Because I've played it so many times. I really enjoy just, you know, experiencing it all at a really fast pace. I don't actually know any, like, real big exploits. I don't think you particularly can in a 100% category. Whoops. Whoops, double oops. This box is even a dragonfly, so that's okay. Because, um, yeah, you got so many of these gems to pick up. It's not the easiest. I like how you can light these up as well. Do you get anything out of it? Uh, perhaps in the remaster. In the 2019 remaster that's been... Was it 2019 or 2018? I think it was 2019. Um, oops. More dragon. More dialogue to listen to. Big enemies like this Gnork with the club cannot be charged. But a quick flame. That should defeat them. And that should defeat them. He says. Very confidently. Like this guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, the 2019 remaster, if you've, uh, uh, if, if you have <laughs> the desire to play this game after 22 minutes of me playing it, uh, is fairly faithful. As someone who grew up with this game, the, the remaster is fairly faithful. Um, it's definitely a recreation of the game, uh, but it tries to do, you know, put everything in the same places. Um, the main difference is, is that in the sequels, Spyro the Dragon is voiced by Tom Kenny. And uh, they got Tom Kenny to do all the Spyro voice lines uh, in the first game of the remaster, as well as the sequels. Whereas, instead, in this game right here, Spyro is actually voiced by Carlos Azle uh, Alizraki. I, I don't know how to say his surname, sorry. Uh, you may know him as Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life. Or, um, I think also uh, Mike Wazowski in that Monsters Inc. PS1 game I played. Actually, he plays Mike Wazowski in all the uh, Monsters Inc. Uh, secondary uh, video game kind of things. Like, anytime Mike Wazowski ever shows up in any of those games, it's, that's, uh, that's Carlos. So, interesting that, uh, you know, he didn't return for the sequels. They, they kept uh, Spyro's voice roughly the same. Uh, for those, but you can definitely tell, you know, it's a different voice actor. Um, but Spyro doesn't talk too much in any of these games, really. There's more dialogue that's not to be, well, that's not Spyro, so. Follow down here, there's one little side area that's lingering in this, uh, hub world. Hey Spyro, press the jump button twice to glide, and, and don't be afraid. Afraid? Of what? Falling from high mountain peaks, plummeting into prehistoric glaciers. Oh, that. That's a mildly interesting uh, 
fact about this game as well. Uh, the uh, This game includes a demo of Crash 3. I think I just activated Toasty, like the, the door back here. I think it's on the other side of that wall. Um, uh, but uh, the developers of this game, Insomniac, are uh, situated literally on the same floor as Naughty Dog, who are the creators of Crash Bandicoot. These games share quite a bunch of uh, rendering tricks and other kinds of techniques. Definitely the same sound uh, CD that they... <laughs> seems that everyone purchased that one CD of sounds. They, they've all got it. Um, and, uh, but, uh, in doing that, they knew that, well, they, they had each other's games, and so they said, let's chuck a demo of each other's games. So on the title screen, there is a, uh, a uh, code you can put in, and that'll let you play a, a demo level. I don't know the level off the top of my head, but it's one of the ones where you're on, uh, your Coco on the jet ski, uh, for Crash 3. Um, and if you play Crash 3, there is a similar code that plays a demo of this game, where you play this hub world, and uh, not Toasty, but the other two levels that I've played. You cannot go into Town Square, though. It, it, it walls you off. It's a blocked door. Um, but it's three levels you get to toy around with, and you get to experience them in basically all their glory. I can't, I can't spot any differences off the top of my head. Um, so all of these worlds work uh, by having... Uh, the hub world, uh, three levels, and a boss level, uh, as well as this, an extra level, which I have not encountered just yet. Welcome to Town Square, Spyro. Begin exploring by gliding to that area with the bulls. Use the L2 and R2 buttons to get a good look. Uh, this game came from the glorious time that, uh, DualShock controllers were supported, a feature that I sorely missed from the very, very first uh, Crash Bandicoot game. Um, I don't know why these enemies don't die when you charge into them. They drop the gem, they eventually die after a few... Like, maybe half a minute. They take their time, I don't know why they just kind of stay there. Um, there's also these interesting gem chests where you flame into them, and uh, well, I guess you can charge into them as well. A gem pops out the top, and you just gotta jump into it. They never return to any of the sequels, because they're a little bit weird. They just thought, uh, it's, a, it's a bit too much work. So... Thanks, Spyro. <laughs> I had the worst itch on the tip of my wing. <laughs> Did you know that you get your longest glides by pressing X at the very top of your jump? So I guess I've kind of glossed over the gliding mechanic as well. The fact that the gliding in this game makes the platforming fairly, um, fairly unique, I would say. Because suddenly you're not just looking for a platform to jump up, like here. There's places that you can get to purely by thinking laterally, I guess. And that's something that I feel like not a lot of games at the time really did. There might be, there might be good examples, but, uh... There's definitely- oh, there's one more guy charging around, oh, well. There he is. Um, I'm gonna keep gushing over this game, because I think it is, like, a near-perfect game. <laughs> Spyro, did you see a man dressed in blue running around here? He's a thief, and he's stolen a dragon egg! You've got to track him down and, and get that egg! Run! Run! <laughs> I'm getting a little winded! There he goes. There's your introduction to, to dragon eggs as well, I guess. Uh, and yes, there is indeed another dragon egg on this level, in particular. Uh, but you get to start thinking laterally about how the level is actually structured. And so, if you notice that you can actually make that jump there, you can you can hear the egg thief, you can see the gems up on this ledge. I didn't really showcase it. I'm going to chase the egg thief because he's an absolute pain if you let him get too far ahead. Yeah. Uh, watch the egg come towards us, because he does that jump over to the next bit, and he's faster in the latter part. Um, very nice person, he put two metal chests right next to the uh, ledge, off to the edge of the, the map. Very fun. I'm just going to pick up these gems and just double check that I didn't, I did leave one. I did leave one. That's good. Um, there we go. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is, I guess, a similar note to that other, to Stone Hill. You know, the boundaries of the level are not necessarily places you cannot access. These levels are thought of 
rather nifty ways of basically kind of finding high ground and gliding over to that high ground rather than just, uh, you know, j just jumping up platforms close to you. Uh, these things are interesting. You flame them three times or pretty quickly and then the, the head kind of falls down somewhere else. Uh, and this is Thor. Thank you for releasing me. And, uh, get, get used to that voice line. It happens a couple of times. Uh, so that's that level done. Um, now there is one last level in the hub world, but we shall not actually encounter it just yet. Uh, I only want to introduce it when the game introduces it. And for the moment, it doesn't introduce it. So I'm, I'm not going to play it just yet, but I'll be playing it on this stream. Uh... I'll pretty much be dividing this game into two halves, where I play the first three worlds and then the next three worlds on the other stream. Um, I, I did say I tried like speedrunning this game. Uh, my record is like two hours fifty something. It's a little bit too long for one stream, and because I'm taking this a bit more casually, I know I'm going to be spending a bit more more time. So I think two streams is a perfect length. Well done, Spyro. I didn't think you could do it. You may travel to the Peace Keep to Keepers world if you like. I like calling it the Pizza Keepers. And uh, in the same way as traveling from one level to the next, I guess Spyro's technically, you know, gone off screen, he's underneath the balloon. But uh, the balloon continues on. And we've reached a new world where the skybox changes, the theme changes, and another dragon invites us to the new locale. Welcome to Peacekeeper, Spyro. Look how our treasure has been turned against us and stolen. We cover our treasure, Spyro. Collect treasure. Got it. So uh, they make the point of collecting treasure this time around. I think that's actually the goal, is that you're supposed to collect 2,000? I'll find out in this level. Uh, we've got these weird cannons. We've got these enemies that keep ducking about trying to get to the cannons. They're shooting each other or shooting the cannons, and then they start shooting you. There it is. I love the sound effects, I swear. So good. I'm not too sure who did all the sound effects as well in this game. Whether the sound effects were done by, like, or on those discs, or whether there's actually, you know, people in the studio making some of them. I think some of them are. Oh. I thought these guys would duck off. Into their little tents. Well, this guy's afraid. He ducks off into the tent. You flame the tent, and he's a little scared, but then you turn around and he <laughs> starts mooning you. Wonderful humor. Wonderful stuff. Uh, <laughs> there are only people under the tents when they duck under the tents. Uh, they're a bit afraid now. Well, at, least, at least some of them are. So yeah, I, I'm gonna keep gushing over this game because I, I do I do really really like this one game. I think it is a great example of taking a formula and just kind of going like, hey, you know, you collect these main big dragons and then lots of little gems, and your goal is just to collect kind of bits of it as you just con continue the game. The Magic Craft as well is far away and very dangerous. Maybe you find 1,200 stolen treasure. I'll show it to you. Uh, you can take the, you can ride the balloonist, or rather you can, you're not riding the balloonist, you're riding the balloon from the balloonist to the next world, uh, or any other world. Hi Spyro! Sparks the Dragonfly has been doing a good job protecting you. Make sure to keep him strong by feeding him lots of butterflies. Uh, sometimes I just give you the same advice over and over again, but granted, it's not like the game can also guarantee you even listen to the other ones, so... Uh, I guess one thing that a modern audience would request from a game like this is subtitles, I guess. I don't know, we're on the talk I was in the talks of the, the Naughty Dog Last of Us uh, quote-unquote accessibility features, and one thing that's actually an accessibility feature is subtitles, and that's definitely a thing that uh, games kind of did haphazardly. Like, sometimes they'd do things, sometimes they wouldn't. Now, I don't know why Kid Me never learned that there was a target here, and flaming the cannon shot a fireball. I knew that they'd shoot a fireball, but I didn't actually realize that it would break that, that uh, pillar. 
I did see these chests, these metal stronghold chests that you cannot break normally, but you can use the cannon to break these open. And I guess that's one other thing I just really like about the game, the fact that it doesn't exactly, like, tell you everything. It gives you a general set of rules, you know, you, you can't flame metal, and you can't charge big things. And then it makes combinations of big things and metal things. And it just expects you to learn, adapt, figure out parts of the level. Uh, those cannons, you can take a guess that, you know, when the camera adjusts to it and you see the other guy shooting you with the cannons, maybe you can shoot things with the cannon. There's another egg thief, this one is probably the slowest one in the whole game, so slowly didn't even take another step. Sure, okay, cool guy. Very cool guy. Is gonna. Well done, Spyro! Keep up the good work, and I know you'll fulfill your destiny. Destiny? I just want to kick some. Just toast those enemies and collect the treasure! I, I'm not too sure what, what's with the destiny angle on this one. Uh, now, throughout this game, there will be, as, uh, as described at the beginning of the game, there are five worlds, or is it six? With 12,000, or is it 14,000 treasure? Um, which kind of gives you a bit of a note that the 14 is maybe a bit of a special number. Uh, but I will say, for the 100% of the game, you're looking at 12,000 treasure, which, I mean, think about 1,200 right now, just to move on to the next world. And that's all the treasure in this level, and I'm only at 900. Um, but don't worry, uh, the, the treasure does accelerate throughout the game. Um, uh, there are also 80 dragons. I've already done 19. The game even says 15%, which seems uh, fairly on point, actually. Uh, so let's enter Dry Canyon, the first of the three main levels in this world. Uh, the levels start getting a bit larger as well, so... They're not all quick fast like that one. In fact, this one's got 400 treasure because it's fairly big. One thing I like doing with these uh, wind things is hitting the enemies with them. Okay, that one just hit something on top of me. <laughs> it did not hit an enemy, sure. Uh, I believe that's a thief just here. These guys are kind of interesting. They shoot bullets at you, these like big thick bullets, but for some odd reason, you can charge into the bullets. Uh, oops. Hold on, take two, take two. I want to show off charging into the bullets. I guess your charge is strong enough. <laughs> I don't know why, I don't think there's really much else in the game that lets you charge into it. Uh, hello, Brad's how's it going? Oh, I should have used the, um, the, the wind treasure thing to defeat the egg thief. That's actually one way you can do it. The original, the original, it's old school. You don't actually have to wait for the egg every time. Uh, there's also only 12 dragon eggs in the whole game, so don't feel like there's too many. In fact, they all stop after the third world. Interesting. Which means, yes, I will be getting all of them in this stream. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm doing a bit of an explanation. Well, not an explanation, but a little bit of a... A, uh... I guess just like a exploratory dive into me. this game. I really love this game. I really love it. And I feel like there's a lot of neat mechanics, especially because, yeah, I first played this game when I was either three or four, and uh, I just really want to kind of explain the bits that made it work. The fact that these enemies, like, dive at you, you know, builds much more urgency than the first levels. Um, I should even note the, those enemies, the, the yellow guys right there. Oh, there's another one later down here. There he is. I should note his uh, means of attack. Is grabbing the bird on the shoulder and just absolute oh wait for it wait for it just slamming him on the ground absolutely hilarious. There's one of very few purple gems in the game that gives you 25 gems. Doesn't really matter what color the gems are, apart from if you're only collecting some of them. In which case, then yeah, some of them do matter. Uh, so now here's another bit of interesting level design. You look over there, it is a bit far away, but you see it. That's the important thing to note. How do you get over there though? It's a real interesting jump, and 
Again, it's one of those you gotta think laterally about how the level design works. You gotta think, like, Dry what's Canyon wide rewards, enough for you. Good gliders. You are a good glider, eh, Spyro? I was born to glide. <laughs> so here, here's your big level tip. You got a dragon here telling you about learning to glide. You got a little bit of a ledge here. It's your objective to kind of spot that. Oh, look. There's a little entryway over here. Just regard those gems on the right. I skipped that on purpose for the moment, but. And you got this lovely little room here. Now, think about it. We just circled this whole pillar just to get back to the start of the level. And there was a little thing there, which means now that you're on this higher ledge, if you swing left, you're now on that ledge. It's a real interesting way to kind of, you know, get you to think about how the level is shaped. Um, and it's all just exploration Incredible gliding. Glide, Spyro. I thought I'd be stuck here forever with those ugly vultures standing on my head. Those birds might look tough, but they're pretty tasty. Flame broiled with a pinch of salt. So I, 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 I still, I will still eternally gush over uh, the remasters did a great job. Love the character and quirks of the original. Yeah, I think I do prefer the original art style just because I love, I love the particles. I love these like you know one pixel like rainbowy particles coming out of sparks. I love uh, just this kind of low poly like LOD style of <laughs> of how all the the textures work out. Um, but yeah, the only thing I'd really knock the remake for is I think the camera is a bit too close to Spyro, and there's no way to adjust it yourself. Um, so it does give like a little bit of an odder angle. I don't think any of it particularly hurts, because you're not doing any like real iffy platforming with, you know, while charging, so it's not too bad. Um, it may, it may also be biased because I've played the game already, so I'm not playing it for the first time, I'm not learning it from that camera but you know what like there's a lot of there are a lot of remasters that do an awful job and uh at least playing the spyro one it's like you know what like i can't not i can't knock it the only other thing i'd knock is the fact that spyro 2 and 3 are not on the physical disc i think if you're playing on consoles i'm not too sure about the switch version um that's just a, that's a that's a technical thing more than anything that you spyro are you the young dragon i've been hearing so much about Ever since you're a wee puff of smoke, we've known, uh... You've known? Ah, I forget. I also appreciate these lines of dialogue that don't particularly have anything to do with anything. But usually you get a bit of a commendation. Also, oh, there he goes. There he's gone. I love this cliff face as well. Just, you know, it's a lovely contrast to being surrounded by canyons this whole level. And suddenly you get this wonderful cliff face, you know. <laughs> and you're allured by this, like, ledge over there. You're like, oh boy, how do I get over there? You know? You're constantly teased with all these really interesting, like, just, you know, pockets of land, pockets of places where you want to get the treasure, because you, you have to get all the treasure. It's not just like, you know, get the coins if you want to get a life. It's like, no, like, every single bit of treasure is its own challenge. It's its own, like, little, you know, nook and cranny for you to uncover. And all the treasure, it stands out visually. So you're always, you know, lured into getting it. Um, the best analogy I can think of is Mario 64. You do have to get 100 coins in each level, uh, but there's a little bit of a mystery why. Like, once you realize that every level is doing it, it starts to make sense. I think I think as a kid you might toy around with uh, getting 100 coins on a level and then you might extrapolate that to other levels. Some levels it's easier than others. But in this game they make it known. There's a percentage right there. You gotta, you gotta do it. And yes, that jump from that ledge, that's, uh, that is the jump. Lots of neat treasure though if you get these, uh, these tricky jumps. Uh, I also glance past those, uh, those, uh, little, um, firework crackers uh, where you flame them and you gotta step back a little bit and they explode and send some gems all over. I hope in the future Spyro games they keep the collection aspects like the treasure eggs etc with jumps like that to make sure the reason. It's definitely something that can be done and given the, the strength of the remaster the only thing I think really um, 
is to be tested is whether they can create a level from scratch. And that's actually one thing I was curious about was whether they were going to add any extra content. Like how in the Crash remaster, they added in a uh, uh, an unfinished level um, that was deemed a bit too hard. They just said, it's a nice little bonus level. You get to the end of the game, you can dart off and you can do that little bonus level. Um, I think there's more involved with the Spyro levels. And generally the Spyro games aren't like too difficult, so I don't think they, they particularly would have had anything too difficult in the works. But, I think it's something that can be done. Not too sure if they ever will though. Here's some enemies that are totally, uh, you know, w w wouldn't happen nowadays in, in kids' video game. Actually, there's a bunch of things that don't happen in kids' video games now. Uh, so these are little banditos, I guess. They're wearing a sombrero, they got a metal poncho on, they got these big fellas with the cooking pot. I love them, I love them. I mean, it's a desert level with cacti all over the place. You know, that's what people wore back then, and, you know. What's the, what's the film? The Clint Eastwood film? The good, bad, the ugly? Is that the one? He's wearing that for like a fair bit of film, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Clifftown, I especially love this level because it's probably got... Uh... Possibly one of the most, like, notorious, like, out of bounds, except still within the bounds level, if that makes sense. How's a dragon supposed to flame metal armor anyway? Remember, Spyro, flame won't harm metal, but charging with your horns, that should do the trick. Now, the other thing I love about this game is not only are you encouraged to think laterally, you then get these remarkably vertical sections. Like, you just look at this and you go, oh boy, oh jeez. You go up to it, it's a little daunting at first, but... Uh, there is a surprising amount of uh, vertical peaks to some of these levels as well. I think just naturally that makes the game fairly more interesting than maybe some other 3D platformers. Uh, maybe Mario 64 and Banjo Kazooie might say a word to me, but... I would also say Banjo Tui is uh, exactly the um, the overkill <laughs> nature that some of these collectathons can get to. Um, if anyone's ever played Banjo Tui, maybe I will play Banjo Tui at some point uh, on this channel. But uh, I will definitely say that Spyro was my bread and butter, and uh, Banjo Kazooie was. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> what? what? What, what would it be in this analogy? I don't know. I played Banjo-Kazooie once, how about that? Let's just say that. I played probably the first two levels of Banjo-Kazooie a fair bit. I seem to always stop after a while though, I'm not too sure why. Usually around like Gobi's Desert, which is not two levels in. Um, let's keep going up. There's a few, you know, of those chests on there. Almost there. At the top. Holy crap, you remember me from the Bugs Life days? Holy crap. Unless... <laughs> oh my gosh. Hey, I am amazed. I am amazed. But I will definitely say... Find out? I will definitely say, I, I'm always surprised when I casually see, like, someone recognize some of my older stuff, because... I don't know, I've, I've always enjoyed just, like, the soliloquy let's play. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah, just keep doing it, because it's good fun. Good fun casually, so I'm glad I'm glad you enjoyed the, the Bugs Life uh, stuff, and uh, I hope you appreciate this sick glide all the way down. And you're like you're across this river that looks like it was just you know for some for some atmospheric uh, atmospheric some environmental ambiance. Like oh, it's Cliff Town. There's a river, big cliff on the other big hill on the other side. You just jump over to it now, like uh, like Stone Hill. You got the force fields. You know, they couldn't quite think of how to how to finish the level from here. Um, none of the levels are like too crazy massive, but definitely I think they're big enough to like you know soak in and understand. And especially without like going into secondary areas, because that's one thing that like kind of makes you know some games a little tricky to understand. Like uh, I'm going to mention Banjo Tooie again. 
having secondary zones or secondary like kind of parts here level does make it harder to really visualize. I think Mario 64 actually does a very good job of not doing it too much. Some levels do have second areas, but not a lot do. And the ones that do usually it's a fairly separate side area. You've reached the highest point in Cliff Town. You can get to almost anywhere from here. If I were you, I'd use that whirlwind there. You can get to almost anywhere from here. I don't know where, where that guy's accent is from. Is that still California? Is that still Santa Monica? <laughs> Can't believe it. Uh, oops. Oh, yeah, someone's gonna hate me for that one. Um, one nice thing is that uh, you do get uh, a couple of uh, whirlwinds. Uh, one for reaching the top here after you've access the top and that makes getting all of these uh, a little easier uh, but also I've got a dash back there because there's a couple of chests just on these like high high ledges probably say this is one of the more collecty kinds of levels where it was just gems and chests all over the place how about let's duck off and let's get the the chest at the back uh, yeah, there's a wonderful, like, chest right there. Well, not even a chest, it's just two gems right here. But I guess that's also kind of neat, is that, like, you know, walk past, like, some of these, you know, parts of the level. And you didn't even realize that there was stuff on the roof. So... So I would just say, you know, three-year-old me, four-year-old me, you know, this kind of idea of thinking three-dimensionally really... Like, that blew my mind as a kid, because I feel like, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this kind of like just maybe a bit of a supposition, but I feel like a lot of games at the time didn't quite get 3D quite right. And even Mario 64, as much as that game feels influential, and it's not the first 3D game I know, um, there's definitely 3D games uh, from before Spyro the Dragon that didn't quite get the idea of navigating 3D space quite the easiest. Is that enough gems? No, I'm missing a singular gem somewhere in this level. That's the only thing I kind of hate. You miss one gem, you're missing them all. Well, you're not missing them all, but it makes you feel absolutely horrendous because you're like, oh no, oh no, where'd I leave it? So I'm going to hope that it's just a the flag. I was here, it's like, ooh, something red. Uh, so where could it be? Out of there, it fell into one of the gaps between the buildings. I always wonder whether the gems, like, they their sparkle seems to be fairly, like, wide on the draw distance. But I'm not 100% sure if, uh, I'm seeing them there, so... I'm thinking it's probably like just hiding around a little building or something somewhere. This is probably why my uh, speedrun is 2 hours 52, because I usually fail to find one gem. Happens once, every single time, I'll miss one gem. I don't know where it is. Always happens. Always happens. I mean, think about it. There's 400 gems in this level. You know, it's bound up. Ah, yeah, I was in the pot the whole time. Well, oh, that shows me. I've gone 53 minutes in the stream and I haven't even mentioned the music. Uh, music is great. Uh, only my only issue is that the, a lot of those fade outs. The song ends and the the, the fade outs and starts again. Um, I do wish that a, a lot of the songs could uh, loop. Easier, they, you know, they set themselves up for loops, but uh, they seem to be just these uh, shorter samples. Um, but there's a lot of themes, motifs I've even mentioned that, like, yeah, the there's there's musical kind of melodies that will uh, reappear between different levels. I think this might be one level actually. No, it's not. I can't think of another level where this happens. But there's a lot of like, you know, great melodies 
um, really captures the spirit of the levels as well. So I wonder if they sent the composer of the music, who you may recognize as Stuart Copeland, who is the drummer for the police. Um, Stuart Copeland, uh, I have no idea what he's done outside of the police other than not only this game, the sequel, the sequel to that, and for some odd reason he also did Spyro Year of the Dragon, the uh, Word of usually caution, forgotten Edward. sequel. Wait until you grow big, like me, before charging those large enemies. But uh, it it's really like unfiltered, like Stuart Copeland as well. It doesn't feel like uh, someone's gone in and, and given him like a hard edit, it's like that. It, really does feel like his music um and uh yeah from from listening to like you know the police discography it's like you know you can you listen to like miss gradenko what's another song he did um i was gonna say any other day kind of that one <laughs> um but uh like the songs that specifically copeland wrote you could you could tell that this is him and it's it's great fun and it's actually kind of interesting as well, they're really reserved when it comes to the drums. I don't think this song's really got anything beyond a kind of like far off percussion. A lot of keyboards in this game, um, I'm trying to think of like other like general motifs. There's a lot of like real interesting synths in the third game, um, but you know, there's so many, so many great like, great musical tracks in this game, I'll just say that. Spyro. Some big norks up ahead are wearing armor, and in the ice cave, armor can make their feet very slippery. Hmm. Hmm. Uh. So, <laughs> I think I mentioned this game is near perfect, and I'll say these two gems. Yeah, no, really, you got to charge the poles, and then the gems fall off. Uh, I would also say this one thing I'm about to do is probably not one of my favorites and that is uh, we've got one of those lock boxes that requires a key. The key is on this ledge down here. You can only really access this from jumping up there. You can probably nail that jump as well. I've done it a few times. But in order to get back up you gotta jump all the way around. You gotta go through the whole, sorry, as in you gotta jump down on le that ledge and eventually come out up, up here. Which means you do that whole area backwards. I'm not a big fan of that. I like killing myself just right there, just so I reappear right up here, just so I can use the key to immediately open this, and so I only have to go through that area once. I do wish that the key was in a bit more of an intuitive spot in some of these levels, because sometimes you end up kind of, you know, kind of doing a bit of a backtrack, but sure. We're also introduced to some more large metal enemies. Uh, but in a fun kind of twist, they're all on icy, uh, icy slopes. The, the dragon alone uh, er earlier alluded to that. Um, and again, it's like, oh, it's it's a fun play on the, the mechanic that you can't, you know, you can't charge big dudes, but you can you can get in the slide. Because uh, I, again, I don't think any other level does this mechanic. I think it's just this level that has these guys, and that makes you know a lot of these levels really unique. Whereas, you know, if I circle back to Mario 64 again, it's like, you know, that game is great, but honestly, Jolly Roger Bay and Dia Dia Docks... Thank you for releasing me. They do blend together a bit. Or, uh, you know, bob Maybe not bob Battlefield, but uh, there's Tall Tall Mountain and uh, Womp's Fortress and bob Battlefield all have the same music. Tiny Huge Island. I'm pretty sure there's one other level in the game. Oh, is there another level in the game that uses the same music? Like, obviously TikTok Clock is very unique. Why why are there more just grassy levels? Who knows? They, they went with just some more grassy levels. Um two snow levels as well. I'm not saying necessarily every level in this game's unique, but at least giving yourself unique music is a good is a good first step. As well as also doing the different skybox, that also helps. Thank you for releasing me. These people really love being released. 
Uh, I'll leave going in there for a little bit. Uh, this is an obvious cue to jump on these platforms, using the treasure to, again, lead you into some interesting level areas. Again, I love the lack of, you know, fog. The fact that I can see all the way to the other side of this cave really makes it feel like it's a larger environment than it really is. Just because I feel like there's other games that you can't see all the way to the other side there. This guy takes two charges, he's he's definitely a charger. He's, 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 uh, he's pushing. Uh, gonna take more marks off again because... Uh, you know, this, I love the fact that snowballs are apparently your greatest enemy in this level. I love this idea of also, like, you know, presenting an area that you can't quite get to, even if you're about to get there in like 15 more seconds. You know, like, oh, I wonder how you get up there. Oh, you just go up this ledge, knock this guy off, and away you go. Die, Snowball. There we go, Ragnar. Ra I have to Does anyone know anyone Done called Ragnar? Well, some dragons thought you weren't ready, but I knew they were wrong. I'm ready, all right. Ready for what? I do wonder what's with the writings and, like, alluding to Spyro having a greater destiny than, you know, he anticipates. Because I feel like he's, you know, on the on track to defeat Nasty Nork, like, immediately anyways. Uh, there's this little nifty ledge up there, if you're the kind of person to go up there. I am missing a lot of... No, I'm not. It's 400. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm missing a lot of... Nah. Uh, you can't go up there, but pretty much the only way to get there onto that ledge with all the lives is to go right to the beginning of the level, glide down, and get the lives. Uh, which involves you, again, being at the back of the level and having to work all your way back to the start. It's not the most intuitive way to do the level. It gets you lives, but... That's better ways of, of uh, clearing the level. And also, you don't really need lives in this game. Like, I've died once and that was on purpose, so. So, let's put that to the test. And confront Dr. Shemp. What a wonderful name of a boss. Dr. Shemp. This level has some of my favorite enemies. If you wait long enough, uh, we got the soup lady, but uh, she slaps a dude who kind of runs at you. And then he eventually jumps off the cliff, because he's got a mask over his face. And, uh, Super Lady's just kind of standing there going on, uh... You can charge these guys, but I think it's really hilarious to watch them just go for it. Go off the edge. You also gotta be a little careful that you don't, uh... Charge these guys too preemptively, but... There we go. One thing that I, I kind of find interesting about this game as well uh, is uh, the fact that the gems can't actually fall off. The oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Is that the gems can't actually fall off the cliffs? Always right where they last would be. Whereas uh, I think in the Year of the Dragon, they definitely can fall off the cliff. Uh, I mentioned the. Uh, the long lost sequel, by the way. So the three games in the franchise is, of course, Spyro the Dragon, released in 1998. Uh, the sequel, Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, unless you are in a PAL region, in which case it is called Spyro 2 Gateway to Glimmer. Glimmer being the first level in that game. I have no idea why they use that name. They don't use that name in the uh, remaster, so it's Ripto's Rage. We'll just call it that. And uh, the third game, Spyro Year of the Dragon. There's no three. This is Year of the Dragon. Uh, I'll finish this by another another dragon. This guy thinks he's so cool. You don't know what it's been like listening to him over and over. But I'll tell you one thing. He should watch his back. There we go. So I'm not too sure why exactly, but for some odd reason, both Naughty Dog and uh, Insomniac stopped, or they sold. Actually, no, they didn't sell the publishing rights to Spyro the Dragon to Universal. Uh, I think they just left. I'm not too sure why, but they just stopped making games. Uh, so this guy is gonna, he's gonna run at you, smack the ground, and you're 
and your flame is back and he goes out, ouch, 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 and the next bridge appears, where he will then take his pain to the next level. This now involves a different pattern. Ouch. I, I, I don't know why I blanked out on that one. He spins around. His back is exposed. I don't know why I thought I'd, I'd run that one. I tried pulling out Dark Souls in that one. And then the enemy just chases you anyways, don't they? One last attack. He sweeps the ground, and he's very dead. Now, I unfortunately do not have sparks on me. In fact, were there any sheep equivalents on this level at all? I don't think so. That's okay. Nearly done with it. So, uh, yeah, I'm not too sure why uh, both Naughty Dog and uh, Insomniac stopped creating Crash Bandicoot and Spyro games respectively. They just went their own ways and made a new franchise under Sony's uh, publishing. That would be Jack and Daxter and uh, Ratchet and Clank, uh, which share a lot of, you know, if you enjoy those games, uh, sorry, as in Crash and Spyro. I have actually not played any of the Jack and Daxes, but I have played the, the, um, the Ratchet and Clanks. At least the first three. Although Insomniac still makes those, so. Uh, again, 300 gems, one dragon. Well, more, more gems than the last boss, but one dragon, just like the last boss. Make your way up, and exit the level. Uh, so that left Universal sitting on the Crash and Spyro brand, and so they made uh, multi-platform follow-ups. Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex, developed by Traveler's Tales, and I have no idea who made Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. Uh, but for some reason it's still got Stuart Copeland, and I'm pretty sure Tom Kenny still does Spyro's voice, so there's probably a lot of other uh, things. Oh, it's done by a developer called Equinox Digital Entertainment. Have you ever heard of Di Equinox Digital Entertainment? Listen, you know they're good when I get a Moby Games uh, entry. I think they made one of the console versions of Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed. I don't know if they made... Uh, if anyone's actually played that game, the PC version is different. Unless you play the PC version, which case the console version is different. Um, PC version is a delight to play. It's a great game. So, uh, this is Night Flight. Uh, there are a flight level on every uh, world in the game, and the flight levels involve you actually flying around. The points fire up and down with inverted uh, flying controls. Uh, disregard that arrow. You didn't see it. It said you're going to follow, and you're going to flame the, the, the glowing chess. Uh, this is probably a nice introduction to the flight levels. It's fairly simple, um, fairly straightforward. All you gotta do is make sure you execute on these flight levels. Um, but they're a nice change of pace, something a bit different, um, and something that they maintained in every single one of the games. They kept it going. They said, this is, you know, he's a dragon. He flies around. We wanted to make a platform collect-a-thon, so we made these special levels just to let him fly around and, you know, Stuff in the race the clock challenges, so you gotta, you know, tick your objectives and get the seconds back. And don't run out of time. Or touch the water. Touching the water uh, does kill you in this one. Just like, uh, just like before, but it's a, it's a hard kill you. Uh, if you can do that, oh, well, psh. if you, if. You, Spyro is supposed to fly up and it's supposed to do an animation, but uh, because I hit the lamp, it, it um, kind of cut off. I wanted to showcase as well. Uh, interestingly, you can hit L1 and Spyro does. Hold on. Uh, you can hit L1 and Spyro does a U turn, and you can hit R1 and Spyro does a loop de loop. Why you'd want to do that, I'm not too sure. The U turn seems a little neat. Uh, kind of interestingly, if you press R1. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you're high enough, Spyro just kind of hits an arbitrary ceiling. If you press R, L1, the camera leans to the side here, and then Spyro will just lean left. He just, he absolutely leans left. I don't know why, he just does this. He goes so slowly. It's a real bizarre mechanical thing. Uh, same thing with R1, kind of. Uh, L2 and R2, which usually are your camera controls, do actually turn your camera, but I usually never do it. Uh, other than that, fairly simple, you just 
swim and you can't even charge, you can't even drop, you can drop in the water and kill yourself, but... That's just the end of a challenge. So as long as you do all the objectives, you get 300 treasure. It's a nice simple 300 treasure, but it's, you know, it's a fun little, uh, little extra mode, extra level. And that's every level in the second world. Uh, so that only leaves one more world left to explore. At least for the stream. <laughs> we'll do the other three in the next stream. God's no the balloonist. You, you might become a real dragon. He's not a real dragon. Hop boy for the Magic Crafters world if you already. Sure thing. Uh, these time trials were a little inconvenient. Uh, I would always avoid them as long as I could. They're definitely, they're definitely very different and challenging. Um, if you're not used to it. And I think that level, it's not too bad. Uh, the one in this world is definitely not too bad because it's not even hiding behind a weird thing you've got to shoot with your, with your thing. Uh, but uh, when I go back to the one in the first world, it's tricky. Uh, you want to get this guy real quick before he jumps over that ledge. Uh, so the egg has uh, arrived. Now, there are seven eggs in this uh, world, two of which are just in this first level. I believe... Uh, off the top of my head, I think the balloonist is going to ask for six of them. Because I have six, I don't think I'll ever know the number off the top of my head. Um, but I, I it's probably six eggs. Crafters. I want you to release the dragons, reclaim our treasure, and recover the eggs from those pesky blue thieves. It's kind of interesting he introduces the world as collecting all three when really you just have to get the eggs for this world. <laughs> You gotta get those enemies. I think you get an achievement in the remaster, just for like charging through all four of them like that. Uh, this world introduces a lot of fancy enemies. Uh, this one's my favorite. This guy moves platforms and makes them go up in front of him. Uh, if you aim this perfectly, by the way, it will fly up and crash into him, or it will crash into the chest and not demonstrate my point very well. Done. Okay. Well, that was a shame. That was a real big shame. So you can't go up in this direction. If you charge fast enough, you'll hit this guy before he uh, raises his platform. Or that guy. And there's only two enemies here that make a clown noise of some variety. Uh, this is the first level, Alpine Ridge. Um, I'm going to explore the hub world first. I think it'll be good to clear out the hub world. Here's the uh, second Egg Thief. There we go. He's on. Can, can need some Dragonfly action. The Egg Thief runs around. He's not too tricky to chase. They're not that bad in this game. I think they get real bad in the second game. And then the third game's a uh, you know, matter of opinion. He's, uh, he's finding it very funny, apparently. Uh, but I actually thought as a kid, like, the Magic Crafters was kind of interesting because it's like... You know, everything is kind of played on its on its head. There's a lot of like, you know, weird things kind of moving things around. The enemies are a lot more involved in the levels and not just like there for you gems. See arrows like these, you can charge along with them to begin a supercharge. Supercharge? Excellent. Go Excellent. Ahead. Try it. Uh <laughs> yeah, so this also introduces Supercharge, conveniently right in front of a level that really exploits the Supercharge. High Caves. But using the Supercharge allows you to charge at that guy fast enough to knock him over. Now I'm also going to use the Supercharge again and do something really quickly, which is if you follow this path down here, you line yourself up to break this one metal chest. You don't have to knock out that guy with the Supercharge, but yeah, you saw that metal chest there. You gotta follow along, get that metal chest with the supercharge. I'm not too sure if this level really makes it clear or whether um, High Caves does. Uh, but, oop, the camera didn't quite like me there, but that's okay, because the wall did. Um, you know, these, these little wizards that shoot lightning and it's raining on them constantly. They're cursed to the rain. Um, this guy's gonna make this platform a bit of a pain. There we go. So I think this guy's gonna just be like, oh yeah, you can go to the next world. Not well for the peacemakers. Uh, no, I'm good. So, uh, yeah. 
I was very curious about the, the Dragon X mechanic, just because they don't have more Dragon X to pick up. Um, which is strange, because they have more dragons and more uh, treasure to get in the other levels. You know, after you... I think the next world requires dragons, and the world after requires treasure, and then that's this it. Last world. To a special place where you can learn to fly. I remember when I was a young dragon, earning my wings. Learn to fly. Got it. <laughs> All right, get get out of the dodge. Let's not let that dragon use our time. Uh, so I think the last remaining uh, treasure in the level is uh, just a nifty glide around here. You might have seen this ledge open. So just trying to figure out where exactly you can get in. Let the key enter, and it's a lot of green gems. But just coincidentally, it is just enough green gems. So there you go, 300, 300, both gems. Blah, blah, blah. Let's do the Alpine Ridge. Alpine? Alpine. Alpine is the F1 team that I go for, and then had its... Driver sign up for the other team. Ah, oh, angry. Ah, uh, that came as a surprise to me. Hearing, uh, literally like hours ago, Fernando Alonso, uh, has signed up to drive at Aston Martin. So, I'm, I'm sitting there going, oh no, who's gonna be on my team next year? Open, uh, one of those, uh, upcoming F2 drivers is gonna do a good job. Maybe I'll, one of, we'll get one of them. Uh, this level also, yeah, really cemented this idea of, you know, the enemies can mean so much more to a level than just sitting there. It's like, this guy's controlling the stairs. You know, that, that blows my mind. Like, as a kid. Like, what other game did that? The enemy controls the stairs. How devious. He's probably the most annoying enemy in the entire game, when you think about it. And then you see what's going on down there, and you're like, oh my goodness. And I thought that was a separate part of but the level, like maybe you get to it elsewhere, but nope. Spyro, you're not afraid of those big, noisy, gigantic, awful beasts, are you? Of course not. I didn't think so. Nice. Good question. So you could jump to your right there and continue on the level there, but if you're a little crafty, you'd notice there's some gems up here leading up to this ledge, which is just high enough to make this jump a reality. And we got these two kinds of enemies, the little green wizards, who keep going up here, and these little blue wizards, ice wizards, I think they're ice wizards, I don't know. Let's get this guy, <laughs> he's not, he's not looking. It's like a little dance on the, oh, good thing that platform was jutting out there. That would have gone a bit nasty. Um, I... I especially love this about uh, these guys. You chase them up here, and then uh, they all start running around. If you take too long, they start thinking you're incapable of taking them out. So, and then you make fun of them by torching the brains out. Brains out? That sounds too painful. Uh, they fainted. <laughs> the Pokemon uh, rules. Uh, they just fainted. What even are these enemies? You flame them and then they all poof out of existence in a cloud of cloud of dust. I would have imagined they're all like nasty nork like oh I, I sailed off I walked off the edge and I didn't jump. Okay. The kind of annoying thing if you do die is that all the enemies that you didn't defeat, uh, or rather all the enemies you defeated before your checkpoint stay dead. All the enemies afterwards don't stay dead. Um, which just means they give you the little circles, which I didn't even mention. You click the circles, and I think there's 20? 20 of them? Is that the right number? Once they form the ring around Spyro's face in the top there, uh, you get an extra life. It's a nice little reward for going back into levels, although it's a really slow way of getting lives, but sure. Gotta make sure you time that one well. That jump is an absolute killer if you time it poorly. Here we are, Eldred Horrors, beyond my fascination. Oh, thank you for releasing me. I, he's thankful for getting released, though. When you think about it, as, as 37 dragons, uh, there's 80 in the game. There are more dragons in the first half than the second half, but there's more treasure in the second half. So that's the trade-off. 
And also, like, what did most of the dragons say? Thank you for releasing me? Like, yeah, you don't need more dragons, bro. Perhaps they actually give you fewer dragons just because after World 4, you know, you're not expected to... You're not required to get any more dragons. I think the next requirement is 50, and 50 in, you know, in the 4 out of 6 world seems like a lot. Watch out for this guy, pops out of the, pops out of the rummage there. This one's kind of interesting as well. You come down here and you got these two guys, and I believe they're attached to posts. They don't chase you far- well, they're not- I actually don't know if- maybe they were attached to the posts in the remaster. They kind of come close, but not too close. Another fireworks container, in a cave, you know, safest place to set them off. Don't you set off your fireworks in the cave? So I guess I got like a, a little bit of an interesting topic in terms of uh, difficulty. I think I was, uh, yeah, last last week I was uh, citing uh, The Last of Us Part 2, or Part, not Part 2, Part 1. But again, on the PS5, calling certain difficulty settings accessibility Great settings. Great work, Spyro. If you keep this up, you'll learn all the tricks of the Magic Crafter world. I wish I learned all the tricks. And you know what one trick is? Figuring out that uh, this is a ledge they intend for you to jump down just into this little gap. Uh, I'm gonna go for... well... This dragon right here, who's named after a unit of Remember temperature. That these blue thieves haven't stolen eggs only in the Magic Crafter world. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. It's kind of ironic at this point, because I think they've only... The only remaining ones have <laughs> are in the Magic Crafter world, so... Uh, this jump I hate because you flame these and you actually have to jump <laughs> jump to the next platform because uh, there's not enough space on the platform. Otherwise, the fire gets you, and that means you got to nail this jump twice. <laughs> you got to jump it, jump back. Uh, it's a bit painful, but that's okay. That's all good. I'm in in the clear. Uh, but one game that I've been playing again is Shadow Man. Shadow Man is a uh, um, I'm gonna say it's a Zelda, um, inspired game, uh, in 1999 by Acclaim. Uh, and, uh, it's fairly neat, actually. I, I did really enjoy Shadow Man. I th actually, I'm playing the remastered version, the Night Dive Samuel Villarreal Special Treatment remastered version on Steam. Um, and it's a fairly good version, but they've got a beta branch right now, which introduces a new difficulty setting titled The Horror. And in it, I, I... I, I'm, I'm just gonna like run the laundry list of changes. So first of all, uh, there is a new enemy. It's like a little like silverfish slug, comes across the ground, appears in a bunch of places, kind of annoying. Uh, there's another enemy, which is, uh, there's a new boss, and I think the boss actually appears in the regular difficulty now. Um, just appears uh, in the, the added in level. There's like a cathedral area, which looks like there should be a boss. They put a boss in. I thought it was like neat, you know. Good on them for chucking a boss. And a new boss as well, like, kinda weird, they just invented it out of nowhere. Uh, also, let's go just drop the life. Cool. Uh, but then, yeah, there are other things of the difficulty, you know, it adds a couple of, like, extra traps into the platforming. One thing I've noticed is there's a lot more spikes, a lot more fireball walls, but sure, okay. Um, but then, really annoying, there's more enemies, they put harder enemies in sometimes, you take more damage, the enemies deal... Sorry, the enemies uh, take less damage from your main weapon, uh, which you have to use the weapon that you run out of ammo of constantly, like your, any of your side weapons. Uh, enemies don't drop health, which is very annoying when they defeat you faster, it's just, it's, it's so many elements stacked on top of each other. And I found, as well, kind of, I, I always struggle to, like, run up here, I swear. Um, all these, like, little tornado, tornado magicians, I don't know. Uh, but it's so much stuff stacked up on top of Please each other. do something about these green druids. They insist on moving everything in sight. There you go, call it here. That's half the dragons in the game. Is that 40? That's 41%. It's close enough. Um, but it's so, it's so horrendous. I found that, uh, there's a lot of times when it's like, uh, there's a room of enemies. Um, oh, and the enemies have new attacks. 
So one example is there's an enemy in the game and he's got a little like musket gun. He fires just these like straight shots. Uh, you know, the, the kind of slow moving projectiles like that enemy enemy, sorry, that any enemies in, you know, late 90s uh, kind of video games would shoot. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but the, you gotta time these jumps a bit nifty as well because they keep moving them. And then you flame these guys on the platform just kind of moves to this decent central position. Uh, but, so those enemies used to only just shoot at you. Now, sometimes their bullets home in on you. But only sometimes. Not too sure why not always. They also sometimes unleash a flamethrower. Now suddenly, you can't just stand close to them and kind of dodge them. They, they'll just blast you with a flamethrower. And then you can't cheese them around a corner because sometimes they'll shoot a grenade. It's a grenade launcher all of a sudden. And the grenade has some AoE damage. You know, you can't stand too close to it. It's all these extra things. I hate those bugs. When I become big and strong, like you, I'll squash them all. Until then, remember that Supercharge makes you invincible. It's all these extra little, like, you know, bits here. But most of the level design is exactly the same. And so it's like, I'm trying to fight these guys who now wreck you in close quarters and around corners when you're camping when I'm trying to fight them through doorways that they've always been behind. It's... It's very anti... Um, antithetical? Is that the term I'm looking for? It just doesn't make too much sense. I believe this theme was the theme of the last level. Actually, no, sorry. Sorry, I take it back. This theme... I don't know why, it's actually a different um, piece of music in this, in the US version of this game, which I'm playing right now. Um, if you play the European version, or you just go on the cutting room floor, you'll find that there's an actual different song used in this level. Um, this theme is a slowed down version of a song that uh, appears in the next world of the game. Um, not too sure why it changed, uh, probably because it was, you know, the same song. Not too sure what's going on there, so... Uh, this level's kind of interesting because you've got these uh, fairies that pick you up over this canyon. Just this level, they also <laughs> get you to kiss that ledge for some reason. Uh, but uh, you can go down here, do a jump off the supercharge, and lots of glide time. Puts you all the way over on the ledge. Uh, but no risk because if you drop down, yeah, you know, you just... You just have the fairies pick you up. Ah, so here's the thing. So you got three of these, like, little spinny things lined up, and you got an egg thief over there. You could chase the egg thief, or you could just hit him with that. I'm very certain that's how they intend, you know, intend for you to do this. You could jump it, but it's really fun using the, using the spinny whirly gigs. I think they probably should have given you a little more space to <laughs> maybe approach the whirly gigs because they're a bit close up to the camera but uh generally they're pretty neat so now i'm gonna turn around i'm gonna go over here i'm gonna give that ant a piece of my mind oops so these are some big ants they're made out of metal for some reason and they absolutely wreck your day and it's not fun uh but you have a supercharge here which you can use and if you supercharge you destroy these big ants uh I think in the sequels of the of this game, Spyro 1 or Spyro 2 and 3, I kind of knew that supercharging large metal enemies was a little annoying, because they kind of had to be in the right spot. Also, these ants don't make a noise when they die. I don't know why. So I'm really curious what, why Stuart Copeland kind of stuck with a keyboard for most of the songs in this game. I think it's a real guitar. It's not too hard to like, you know, when, when you're an established musician. Now, you gotta be quick, by the way. You gotta take out this guy and then stand on the ledge before the ant like chases you up here. Same deal with this one. You wanna, you wanna get the green dude so he's not blocking the doorway. And then you can walk out. Up here, we have a fairy. The fairy gives you a kiss. And suddenly, Spyro is so flushed, he breathes really strong fire. You can take a, like a guess at the fire, you know, the animation makes it look like he's, you know, got that super flame. Uh, 
think they just refer to that as the fairy's kiss. It happens in, I think, three levels total. And in particular, that's the only use of it on this level, just to take out the two ants that you walk past when going uphill, because you can't get the, the uphill ones with the supercharge. So, I just wanted to do that then and there. Let's go around here, get some more gems. There are 500 gems on this level. And, uh, you'd be amazed how many of them are right at the end of the level. We'll kiss the ledge. Mwah. One last hole in the wall. You might have seen there's another hole later on, but nope, that's just the first hole. Just, again. Look at that, all these purple and yellow gems. All at the end of this level. It's a great reward. Begin to the end. Uh, yes, so there's 500. I'm just gonna spoil it right there. And here is Cedric. Try combining supercharge with jumping and gliding, and really explore the high caves. Yeah, I, I, I may have gotten everything in this level by now, for sure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, the, the difficulty in that Shadow Man mode, I feel like it's just, it's unwarranted. It actually had one feature earlier as well. Um, and yeah, your only saving grace to really beating the game in that difficulty is uh, when you die, you just rock back to the last checkpoint uh, without, um, you know, all the enemies you defeated stay defeated. You're just back at the checkpoint. The checkpoint is either the very beginning of the level or the one warp point in the level if you've walked past it. You get a free quick save slot. Or, or save slot if you want to. This is a flight level. This is usually the first flight level you go into, by the way, so it's uh, very clear and easy um, where you're supposed to go. But it's also the third one in the game, technically, if you uh, are following the worlds. But you're not supposed to know that there's a flight level in the first world yet, so we'll get there eventually. So you just follow the... Follow the arches. I love these arches, nice and buzzy, and then they all break apart. Uh, so, the way that I see this, that they intend for you to do, is to follow the arches down, ignore the chest for the moment, try and get all these uh, planes. There you go. Your time keeps buzzing at you, but I, I swear this works out. You get all the planes. And you're right in front of the first chest again. I think they've timed the sequence well. Spyro 3, all of its flight levels are particularly good at uh, laying out the sequence of things to get. Um, late, later in this game, uh, you might see it. It'll go otherwise. But this is the animation that's supposed to happen. All the little symbols start dancing around, and then... Then it ends. That's, that's what you're supposed to do. New record, and Spyro goes... Whoosh, fly into your face. So, uh, my point with the Shadow Man stuff is that, um, yeah, I feel like difficulty can go both ways. There's an intended difficulty, I think there's something that the designers always want. And then, uh, I don't know, you can kind of feel when a difficulty is just harder than what the designers really intended. Or, uh, is too easy for what the designers intended. It's very... you can kind of gauge it. Um, and I always wonder whether playing games at... The intended difficulties is the best way of going about it, or whether uh, playing the game at a, you know, the difficulty that feels maybe more right for you. Like, I definitely know those games where it's like, I up the difficulty, I, you know, make it so uh, the enemies are more, more combative against me, but, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, what, what's a game like that? It's like Doom's a good example, it's like, you know, there's, there's, there's five difficulty levels, but really there's three difficulty levels. There's, there's Hurt Me Plenty, there's Ultra Violence, and uh... What's the, what's the name of the second difficulty? Like the, the, the easier one? I was gonna say like, Not Too Rough? I think it's Not Too Rough. They have a uh, I'm Too Young To Die difficulty level, I think, which is easy, is, is, uh, sorry, uh, not too rough, but without, uh, well, with double the ammo. Welcome to Wizard Peaks. This is my favorite supercharged spot. 
Use it to bash those wizards. You gotta bash him. Uh, so I'm gonna back out because uh, this level has a real interesting like little side cut, and you just have to really see it. Um, also, note the music. Yes, if <laughs> this confused me at the time, Stuart Copeland also composed the uh, Amanda Show theme music. The Nickelodeon show starring Amanda Bynes, who has uh, kind of disappeared from a lot of the public spotlight right now, so I'll just say that. But uh, yeah, now Stuart Copeland decided to reuse the theme. He composed it for this game, and then said, eh, what's, what's the odds? Someone will know. I knew, Stuart. I knew. Kind of blew my mind that Stuart Copeland's not British. Like, I, I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's like, he's in the British, like, power trio. And he's not from England. What was he doing in England? Who knows? But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Doom's got the really easy difficulty level, and then it's got the nightmare difficulty level, which, in some levels, it's, you know, it's fine, because ultraviolence can be a little on the easier side at times. And then there's some levels where... Nightmare is way too hard. There's, just, there's too many enemies. The idea of enemies, uh, like, moving faster or respawning, I guess, is also just like, uh, okay, sure. I love this, like, part of the level here, where you just, like, you go on the rooftops of the level. You just, like, you know, you see the chest, you know where to go. You stand here, you go, ah, okay, I gotta glide over here. And then you surprise this guy. He's like, oh my gosh. This is what I, mean, uh, what I mean with the music. I wish it looped a little bit nicer in this game. It does a better job than the, the later games. Now you can do charging Skittles. And then you supercharge up the other side and you suddenly slow down again. But it's kind of nice. You can also charge into those things if you want to, whereas you can't charge into them otherwise. Uh, here's another charging spot. Lots of enemies here. Now this... took me forever as a kid to really understand. I'm gonna also charge into that. And I guess, I guess I'm running into this guy. Thank you for releasing me! Oh, okay. He's, he's very thankful. He's very thankful. Uh... But yeah, no, this... This, I never realized. I always thought, oh, I gotta supercharge down here and jump up the other side. But you'll see me do like these terrible jumps. That's not, I, I kind of called it off a bit earlier, but that's not gonna get you the distance. What you're supposed to do, and I'm not even kidding, this is the only time in the entire game that really uses this mechanic. You gotta go down one supercharge and then go down the next one. Spyro's boost then turns really deep orange, which allows you to then gain the distance you need to go up the next hill. It is a mechanic that I have no idea. It happens twice in this level. They give you an egg thief that is just so contempt that he just sits there. By the way, two egg thieves in this level, uh, and that makes all the eggs in the entire game. Uh, there's a wizard, by the way, he's walking his way up and he's spawning all these enemies as he goes along. Um, if you're quick enough, you can actually get the wizard and it just spawns and then immediately defeats every enemy as you walk up this hill. Uh, I'm gonna take one extra step to the side because I want to get up that other up that other ramp there. I guess you can go either left or right. I'm just a, a righty. I'm right-handed, so maybe that's why. Uh, so difficulty can go both ways. Um, that's my main take on. Uh, but I definitely feel like yeah. I mean, sometimes a game that has one difficulty is really nice, and in some ways as well. Uh, and as evident in some later Spyros, sometimes having a, a difficulty that does adapt nicely can feel probably more, you know, I, I was gonna say inclusive, that's not the word I'm looking for, but like, feels more inviting for a game that might be tricky, but definitely like rides the line and then rides your line in particular. So uh, one thing I guess to note, uh, thanks for the follow, uh, Such. Uh, one thing I really like to note is uh, with Spyro 3, I know the Crash Bandicoot games do it as well. Um, just something simple like if you die uh, too many times, they'll give you a, a free Aku Aku at the beginning of, well, when you spawn back in. 
Um, but sometimes, uh, I know in Spyro 3, if you die on a boss too much, it actually... the boss will attack less. And act, I... I want to say it takes less hits? Maybe it doesn't. But they attack less. There's like, sometimes they do like three attacks back to back. And then they just decide, oh, I'm gonna do two. And that's it. Um, I think some of the other challenges, it's like maybe they increase the time enemies take to uh, perform, you know, some actions. That is probably one of the most mean enemy placements in the whole game, though. But they give you a nice big guy right there. I think that's actually it, isn't it? Let's watch that number spin around. Ding! There we go. Listen carefully, Spyro. There's a secret area in the Artisan Home. It is at the waterfall. Try jumping on the stones there. Artisan oh. Home? Waterfall? Sounds good. Sounds good. That is a... a, a remarkable clue. Uh, because, yes, there's a, there is a secret just in the first level. You can trigger that secret immediately. Although it does remove one of the prompts to tell you that you're doing the secret. But it's there. It's... It's happening, so... Uh, let's do the boss level. He blows, he's hard, he's blow hard. Don't think about it. <laughs> this is probably one of the weirder bosses. Because you're not even, like, you're barely even aware of the boss. Listen, do I trust myself to not take a hit? Not at all. But most of the time taken in this level is literally just like stopping for treasure <laughs> because they chuck 400 treasure and, and you know it's a boss level it's fairly short fairly straightforward smash an open chest oh oh he nearly got me there yeah no i i, I really like this game I, i'm just gonna keep gushing about it like that but I do feel like most of the things this game does, it's like, it's really crafty how it works. So you want to not get hit by the cloud, you then ducks down, and then uh, proceed to flounder because I think you're supposed to charge him. Listen, I haven't played this game for a year, we'll just say that. i played a lot of other games. Did he just drop another life? Being a bit generous on the lives today, but you know what, I'll accept it. Ah. No, oh, you do flame him. You do flame him. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, so, so he just ducks off. It's another one of those, uh, hit him and then he ducks off at bosses. You know, like the last two, I guess. They went much more traditional on the bosses in the sequels, didn't they? Where it's just, here's the boss arena. Hit him ten times. Literally. Thanks for releasing me, Spyro! You have no idea how long I've been trapped in crystal. And, uh, neither do I. Who are you again? Um, I'm out of here. He's out of here. He's gotta go. So 46 is my nice fun number that I, I know to my head. Because it's like, oh, that's the number of dragons in the first three worlds. Uh. Which, yeah, it's, like, <laughs> the game's saying more than 53%. I'm gonna be at, what, 5,200? Treasure, 5,500, because I'm going to do the white level. Uh, that's out of 12,000 treasure. Uh, the later levels go a little slower in terms of treasure. Uh, maybe, off the top of my head. Let's flame him, and he drops a yellow gem, and then jumps the gap. But yeah, I'm actually curious. How long does this game take for new players nowadays? Like... I feel like I was young. I really had no idea what I was doing. This was also pre Game Facts, pre anything. Uh, maybe Game Facts started being a thing when I started doing stuff, but uh, definitely by the time I was doing Let's Plays on YouTube, when I was a young wee lad 12 year old who didn't know right from left. And uh, Spyro was not delegated to being a uh, Toys to Life concept where they. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that a bizarre way to change Spyro's legacy? This is just turn him into that, so... We can go to the Beast Makers. Let's go back to the Artisan's home, just for the time being.
and encounter that one last level and call it a stream. Uh, yeah, isn't that kind of weird? Like, and it's it's strange because Spyro. I did play a Hero's Tale as a kid. I have not played any of the other Spyro games. Uh, here's your secret, by the way, and you can activate this ahead of time. But if you hadn't spoken to that one dragon, these platforms don't light up and they don't make the sound. So it doesn't look like you're doing anything, but you can activate it ahead of time. And we have Sunny Flight, a flight level sitting there. This is actually one of the trickier flight levels in my, uh, in my mind. But it's also one of the more spectacular ones because you've got this wonderful vista view. Uh, so what I like doing is I like starting with the barrels, uh, with the trains. You only have to flame one of the barrels or hit both of them. Uh, just chase them up and you'll get them all like that. And now uh, you want to get the planes. Now the planes, half of them fly towards you, half of them fly away from you. And they're not evenly spaced either. Which makes it a little tricky. Alright, and then uh, I'm gonna go for these two. Maybe I haven't done it in quite the best direction, but look, I got 35 seconds left over. And these get uh, these archers give you three seconds each, so shouldn't be too little time to to waste. But we're flying around the other side of the island. So this is where some of the flight levels start to get a bit more freeform, ironically on the first world's flight level. Uh, but they start expecting you to, you know, toy around with it, play around with the level, figure out which path works and which path doesn't. Uh, if you're playing the remaster as well, you may notice there are skill points. Skill points were introduced in Spyro 2, uh, and they kind of backported them for the first game in the remaster, which is kind of cool. But uh, I'm playing the PS1 version, they don't exist. Uh, some of the skill points involve beating the flight levels uh, as quickly as possible, so in an even quicker time to the ones that they list. I had 31 and a half seconds left over, so I'm curious whether that actually is the time. Is 1 minute 36 a time that is okay? If it is, you could just do that. You could you could do that, and you're good, so. So there we have it. 5,500 gems. 46 dragons. Every single dragon egg. And the game says 55%, which uh, is kind of curious. Um, I wonder where it's getting 55... Oh, I'm just going to get kill myself there. Uh... So how about I will jump up to the top and hit the save. But yeah, that is kind of curious why it says 55%. Maybe it weighs the dragons way more into it. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, I'll call that it for a stream. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed that. And uh, make sure that you all... Uh, that's not boring. There we go. And uh, <laughs> maybe... Oh, uh, you're having a maybe on that one. You didn't enjoy it? Can't believe it. But yeah, if you if you did enjoy it, you can follow and I'll stream the same time next week. Where I'll pretty much be playing just the rest of the game. Um, nah, the dragons. Did the dragons even win this week? There's a lot of dragons in sport. You can, you can take a guess which dragons I'm thinking of off the top of my head. I don't know. Uh... But yeah, no, if, uh, if you missed part of this stream, uh, I guess the VOD's always there, but if you really missed some of it, or you want to see it in a little bit of better quality, because Twitch, you know, only has a certain quality, they'll end up on my YouTube, and you can subscribe there, or follow here. I don't make money off, well, I do have ad revenue. I don't really make money, it takes forever, so, <laughs> I don't know, fun passion project, who cares, have fun for the rest of your week. If you missed me, well, you can you can say hi right now, so eat your greens, stay safe, don't stay up too late, and remember, it's August. Daylight Savings is coming up in like two months. You gotta be prepped. Alright, have a good one, everyone. Catch ya.